Hello, everyone. I'm Pamela Brewer, welcoming you to this edition of Mind Talk. So I have a question for you. Is it true that marriage is no longer a thing to do? Um, is marriage old-fashioned? Is it passe? What are we thinking? Nowadays, women are buying their own homes. They have their own careers. They are having their own children with or without a mate. So Today's guest is going to help us figure that out. And I am happy to introduce Marcia. I'm sorry, her name is not Marcia. Her name is Marcia. Marcia Naomi Berger, who is the author of Marriage Minded, an A to Z dating guide for lasting love. Marcia, welcome to Mind Talk. Oh, thanks for having me here. Well, you know, as we said a moment ago offline, you and I talked when your first book came out. So it's really delightful to have you back for your second book. Very nice to be here. And um, I'm happy that I have the second book finally finished. <laughs> I, I understand that, too. Now, let me ask you a, a question. You, you say in your book that you were an a ch adult child of divorce marriage wasn't necessarily the thing that was on your plate. And your mother gave you really interesting advice. She told you to go get a dog. <laughs> I actually did. I always wanted a dog. <laughs> well, but you then also got a husband too. So uh, yeah. how, how do you go from go get a dog to being married for many years and now bringing us marriage-minded, a A to Z dating guide for lasting love. How, how did that happen? That's quite the transition. <laughs> yeah, it was a long journey. I was single for a long time. In fact, when I finally got um, engaged, I told my mother and she said, it's a miracle. <laughs> and, uh, and at my wedding, one of my friends <laughs> said, it's the end of an era because I'd been <laughs> going to all these singles events and dating and being in relationships for <laughs> over 20 years. Uh, and how did I finally get married? I, I think a, a quick way to say it is I got past my ambivalence. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a child of divorce and my parents divorced when I was 13. And uh, unconsciously, uh, I wanted marriage very much, but I was also afraid that I would not be able to create a good marriage because of what I witnessed at home. And well, you know, it's interesting because you've almost taken, in fact, you have, you've taken the, my, the first question sort of out of my mouth. You use the word ambivalence, which A equals ambivalence and many other things. Talk about the ambivalence that so many people have when it comes to marriage. What's that about? Well, it's kind of partly about my experience, I'd say, and also partly about how marriage has changed. A lot of People are afraid because either they're divorced, their parents were divorced, they know about the high divorce rates, which are even higher for second marriages and even higher for third marriages. So um, just looking at statistics, it's easy to be frightened of marriage. I think we all have a yearning to be married. Um, and we also have, a lot of us have this fear that it's just not going to work out. Um, and that also has to do with why there's so much divorce. And I think it's because people don't know what they're looking for. As you mentioned, Pamela, <laughs> the expectations are not what they used to be. Women can support themselves, buy houses, have children, live with a man if they want to, um, without having this the marriage ceremony. And uh, what's, what's changed now, uh, and people unconsciously don't know this necessarily, they're looking for spiritual and emotional fulfillment in a marriage. And when they don't know they want it, but they know something's wrong, that's when they say, oh, marriage isn't working, it's outdated. They blame the institution rather than the change in expectations. And also because the expectations are skilled, uh, have changed, new skills <laughs> are needed uh, in order to create the kind of marriage that we all deep down inside yearn for. You talk about anxiety. Uh, and again, in, in your book, you you literally take us from A to Z in terms of the various kinds of emotions or questions or experiences that people have when it comes to the issue of marriage and long-term commitment. Let's talk about anxiety. You, you never fail to hear about somebody getting to the altar, They whether they've dated for a month or for 10 years, they get to the altar and all of a sudden becomes a question, am I making a mistake? Is this the person I really love? Is this right for me? Are you talking about that anxiety 
or a different kind of anxiety? Uh, I'm talking about anxiety people feel in general about getting married. A lot of people are afraid that they're going to lose themselves uh, because they'll have to cater to the wants and wishes and needs of their partner. I think that's a really big one for a lot of a lot of women and a lot of men too. There is a guy I knew who felt like he he got he escaped because he didn't get married. He had a, a co-worker who said, my wife won't even let me buy a bowling ball, you know, which is kind of, I don't think that's a typical good marriage. Right. Kind of sad <laughs> to hear that though, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so anxiety is, is sort of standard. Um, it makes sense. It makes sense if people feel ambivalent. So one of the things that I'm going to think that you probably agree with is that it makes sense to have a lot of different feelings about dating, about getting marriage, about long-term commitments. You, as, as I said, you go through a list of things that people have experienced. One of them is the word diligence. What does diligence have to do with getting married? Um, I think it has to do with keeping your eye on whatever is going on and not not letting the little irritations build up into grudges. It means paying attention day by day uh, because all of us, let's face it, we all can be annoying. All of us, you know, we might focus That's, on our partners. And how dare is. you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I didn't do you. I meant, I meant everybody else. Everybody <laughs> but me. <laughs> I have a confession. I think you're right. We all get annoying at times. Yes. Um, uh, I'll quote um, Rabbi Yosef, he said, everybody's annoying. So you find the person who annoys you the least and you marry that one. Well, you know, there's there's some wisdom in that. <laughs> yeah. So but but the idea is to, uh, to look at the big picture, even though we annoy each other, we, if we know that the pros way outweigh the cons, um, then then we learn how to have a little exchange. I put up with your little annoyances and you put up with my little annoyances and, and we have a lot of fun together anyway. Find a way and, to make it work. Yes. Yeah. And my first book, we talked about how the marriage meeting, which helps keep everybody feeling appreciated and, and uh, taking care of business as, as things happen. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Let, let me ask you this. Your mom gave you some, going back to mother, Mother gave you some interesting advice. She said, don't marry doctors because doctors are too stuck up. Lawyers right. argue too much and gamblers and drinkers were to be avoided at all costs. Did you follow your mother's advice? Did I follow? <laughs> well, I, I did date doctors and I dated lawyers and um, I ended up marrying an accountant. So I, can, I, I maybe unconsciously I was following her advice, but I think it, it just it was the right time and the, and the right person. So, so <laughs> sounds like you, you've made mother proud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not only to make her proud, a few years later, my mother got married after a long, long decades wow. of, of feeling quite unhappy about what wow. had happened to her marriage to my father, blessed memory. How old was your mom when she got married? Uh, she was about 77. Well, so it's never too late to get married if that's what you feel like you want to do. If that's what you want, it is never too late. And they were the best years of her life. She, he was a man who cherished her. That's wonderful. Is yeah. being cherished, is that something that we should look for in relationships? I think we want to look for kindness and we want to look for respect. And you can call that being cherished. Uh, you can call it good behavior. <laughs> you know? But but to... Uh, you know, somebody who, who gets you, understands you, and loves you anyway. <laughs> Th those are yeah. important things. Yeah, and, 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 you know, we have to get ourselves to a place where we can be that way also to have empathy for our partner and have that beautiful balance between my needs and his needs so that um, we all get what we want, what we need enough that um, we're going to be generally satisfied and we're keeping the relationship forefront in our mind because that's, uh, there's three factors. There's him, there's you or her and you, <laughs> and, and then there's the relationship. And if we do what's good for the relationship, it's going to be good for both of us. You talk about deal breakers and, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people and it's really amazing what 
people will consider deal breakers. I mean, I've heard people say, if he doesn't say he loves me in 90 days, it's a deal breaker, I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I've heard people that that was somebody who was admittedly, well, I don't know, she was in her 30s. Um, you know, I've also had people say, man, I'm thinking about in particular, he was dating a woman for five years. She was separated from her husband, but not divorced. And for him, he was only willing to wait the sixth year and then it was going to be a deal breaker if they weren't able to be married. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's patient. <laughs> that's a lot of patience. Give us an example of what you would consider to be reasonable deal breakers. I'll, I'll give one for my own life. OK, um, this might be in my book under my name or I might have made a synonym because I change everybody's names. I have some of my own personal stories that I take credit for. Uh, so this is one where I I was infatuated with this uh, man. He, he was just so sweet and so romantic. We were taking a walk. I've been, I think it was maybe our second or third date. And we're taking a, a walk with, remember, I got a dog with my little dog. That's right. <laughs> Cute little dog. And we walk in and he said, and now just background, by new, then I knew I wanted to get married and I knew I wanted to be a mother. Okay. And have a husband who wanted to be a father. <laughs> so walk along with my cute little dog, beautiful day. And he says, doesn't having a dog tie you down? Oh, right. So if we read between the lines, which I did not yet, I still went out with him another time or two, <laughs> but I, I, need, I need to really get conclusive proof uh, that this was not for me. Uh, in, in other words, I ignored a red flag um, because if he thinks a dog <laughs> is going to tie him down, uh, well, how does he feel about marriage and fatherhood? Absolutely. So, so, Absolutely. So that, that, looking back, it should have been a deal baker right away, but it, it took another couple of dates. And this was a very pivotal point in my life because I used to let things drag on and on. But this was after the fourth date when I was still so infatuated with him. And when he was leaving um, after a date, he, we, he said, no, I said, oh, um, when are I going to hear from you again? I'm looking forward to it or something like that. And, and he's going, whoa, 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 you know, he's waffling. And, and then I, I said, I, was, I don't know, there was something in me where I just really wanted to play this thing out. And, and he, I said, well, you know, how about you call me on Tuesday or Wednesday? And he said, I don't like pressure. I don't want pressure. You know, and I, that was it for me. I was yeah. done. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that, that was my deal breaker. But, you know, you mentioned some deal breakers. Everybody has their own deal breaker. And I don't know, you know, what's rational, what's not for different people. I don't know their background, but um, I think I agree with you that, that these were kind of, um, what was the one where, where you said, if he doesn't say, I love you in three months, well, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, that, that's a little too specific. You know, we don't want to be too rigid. I think the deal breakers are uh, really should be more about, um, are you on the same path? You know, are you dating for marriage or are you dating for recreation? And ideally the, the two should meet and other deal breakers you mentioned, uh, I think if, well, my mother's <laughs> I like, um, somebody who has an addiction and they're not taking care of it. It's one thing if they, maybe they have a problem with alcohol or drugs, if they're in treatment, it's one thing, but if they're perfectly happy and don't think they have any problem, right. you don't necessarily want to be with somebody like that. Um, but again, it's an individual thing. Some people are okay with it. Some aren't, you know, I, I think uh, I'd have to think, I hope I don't sound too judgmental, but if people are fairly emotionally and mentally healthy and, and living a kind of a clean more or less sober lifestyle, you know, not 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 necessarily teetotaling, but you know, reasonable. Um, then they want to be with somebody who has a similar kind of lifestyle and health style. So if there are big differences there, that could be a deal breaker. And like the one I mentioned, if one wants children and the other doesn't, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, so so different ones, and and then lots of other ones for different people. But the the phony kind of deal breakers, I'm calling them phony, that don't make sense. Like um, like I like to ski, and it would have been nice if I married someone who liked to ski, but my husband doesn't ski. But to me, that's not a deal breaker. That's a difference, and we negotiate. Right. Right. In the book, I have and is for no negotiate before we're married. I said but I. I forgot how the conversation went exactly, but it basically was um, he agreed to go up 
to a skier with me at least once a year. That's okay. great. Yeah, it was great. He told me later he thought I'd be quitting in a few years because <laughs> I married so late that you know most people my age had already stopped skiing uh, or what by you know by in a few years and now I still ski. So <laughs> but, but you fooled him, said, didn't you? What? <laughs> you fooled him, didn't you? <laughs> I didn't know that was what he said. It just didn't occur to me. And my family, everybody skied, kept skiing. <laughs> my father was skiing in his seventies. <laughs> Let, let me, since, since we've been talking a bit about folks getting married at, at an older age, mm -hmm. what is your sense of how to approach that? Again, I've heard anything being said from, you know, I'm 40, I know what I want, or I'm 65, mm -hmm. I don't have time to wait, you, you know, and, and everything in between. Is it reasonable to think that depending on your age, you should give yourself a year or less or more, or does time really not factor in? Oh, that's a hard one because if somebody wants to have children, then time, right. it's hard. But let, let's just say in general, and we'll ignore that for now, um, that when people, the best time to get married is when you feel emotionally, psychologically ready. And that could be when you're, 18 or 20, or it could be when you're in your 40s or, or, or more. Um, so, so I don't think anybody should be getting married because of a kind of a time pressure, because um, that could get in their way of making a wise choice. Absolutely. And I do believe that what we want to have happen is the right person at the right time, whenever that is. You do workshops um, for single women and you also do marriage and communication workshops for, for everybody. But in your marriage minded workshops, uh, I may have just renamed your workshop. I'm not sure. That's OK. <laughs> you, might, you might have hit on something. <laughs> you ask your the participants in the workshop to create three lists. What are they? I love the lists. There are three lists. One is what are you looking for in a marriage partner? Two is what do you have to contribute to a marriage partner? I say 10 each, don't make it overwhelming, just 10 each. And the third list is in only five things, because we're gonna be gentle with ourselves. What are the five areas in which we could grow and in which uh, our marriage partner would appreciate um, that we would improve in these areas. So the idea is that that nobody is perfect and uh, if we can accept that in ourselves, that helps us to accept that in our partner. What I hear you saying consistently in one way or another is that marriage is really a union of two. It's not emotionally as well as operationally, obviously. It's not just what can he give me or what can she give me? It's what do I bring to the table as well? And and you encourage folks to be really realistic about that. Yes. Yes. I think it's really, really important. And when we're moving from single to married, we are moving from kind of an I consciousness. It's all about me, what I get. Um, we're moving to a, a consciousness of the other person, of us together, a relationship, which means that we do need to um, keep all the time in our mind, basically, uh, you know, there's room for his needs, his, her, you know, our partners, right. Uh, right. What makes our partner feel happy and fulfilled. And, and uh, ideally it's, it goes the other way too. So we're, so we're, there's a giving that's gone from both ends Absolutely. And, and, a, and a really beautiful receiving. Is a conversation about values important in a marriage? Does it matter if you share values? Uh, I, I think that's uh, one of the most important things is to share values. In the book, uh, Marriage Minded and A to Z, Dating Guide for Lasting Love, you know, each letter is about usually at least a couple of different topics that start with that letter. And V is for values. It's really, really important um, that you share the kind of essential values. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of examples is, you know, are, are we, this is an extreme example, but you kind of know this from various things that happen with the person when you're seeing them for a while. We don't always 
talk about this is what I value, but you know that if you come from a similar spiritual or religious background um, that you've been paying attention to, or even unconsciously, you're going to probably share a lot of uh, common values um, and the character traits that go with the values. Like um, it's important to be honest. It's important to uh, earn your living, you know, what, what, whatever um, character traits. Kindness is a really big one. A lot of people leave that out on their list and they might talk about a when we were talking about the list, I also would like to add that uh, I often help people separate on their list what they want from what they really need. You know, does he have to have blue eyes or a certain occupation? Right. Or is it more important that he be kind, that he be emotionally healthy, more or less, <laughs> who's perfect, um, right. if you know what I mean? Um, so, so a lot of those 10 on the list for what I want and what I have to offer, ideally, it's, it's how I'm going to live with somebody every day. And there is a huge difference between potentially between what I want and what I need can yes. be huge. Can be huge. Let me ask you this about online dating. That's clearly a thing and it's been going on for a while. What's your sense of that as one is looking to, let's say, re-enter mm -hmm. uh, the, the dating market for whatever reason, whether it's a divorce yeah. or a death? Is online dating, is that okay? Or what do you think? Oh, well, of course it's okay. Um, as long as it's done sensibly. Um, a third of marriages uh, in recent years have started out with online dating. Hmm. And I know of some people in that category. And the, being sensible is recognizing that there is a lot of uh, kind of negative stuff going on online with people yeah. who misrepresent themselves. So so yeah, I'd say, you know, do it cautiously yet optimistically and find out about the person for sure before you would meet them in person. And some people do it on social media. They look at how they represent themselves other places. Uh, and also some people, and I think this is really a fine idea, uh, although it may sound kind of odd, uh, but actually ask for references uh, that you can talk to about the person. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I know a couple that did this. They had both been disappointed with strange people, I guess, that they first met online. So, so they both offered to give references of people that the other could talk to. They've now been married for around, around I don't know, 15, 18 years, and they have four children, and they're quite happy. <laughs> I, I never would have thought of asking for references, mm. you know, I, but I think people tend to do that anyway. You know, who do you know? How do you know this person? But, right. but to, to put it in that kind of a formal language, I think sort of elevates the practice to something that's really a reasonable, really reasonable practice in which to engage. Oh, yes. And in the case of the people that I just mentioned, they had lived in different countries. He's in what he was here in California and she was in Winnipeg in Canada. Um, so they're not going to know the same people. They're not likely to know the same people. And, and this happens, right. you know, these, I, I know another couple where the guy's from Canada and they met online and she's, she's from the San Francisco. Um, and, and they're have they look very, very happy together. Yeah. Let's, let me ask you about this. You know, in, in the old days, um, not that I remember the old days, but in the old <laughs> days, you know, um, <laughs> I understand completely get it. Sex before marriage was, really a terrible thing. Nowadays, hookups, sexual hookups are sort of the thing. What's your sense of that in, in terms of a long-term commitment? Is it important to, to be sexually aware of each other beforehand? Should you wait till after the marriage? Is that just a way too old school kind of question anyway? Oh, I don't think it's an old school question at all. Um, and I don't think hookups are anything new. Uh, maybe they weren't happening 100 years ago, but they were certainly happening uh, in the 70s. Um, True enough. And, and, and beyond, I think once the AIDS came along, then that maybe people became started becoming more cautious. Um, now, is it a good thing or isn't it a good thing? I think it depends on what people want. Um, if they want marriage. Uh, the statistics are that the longer people wait to have sex, the more lasting and fulfilling the marriage is. Mm. So uh, a lot of it is really knowing what you want. And if you, I write about this in the book, 
marriage minded uh, under S, <laughs> S is for sex. And we have different ways for different women and how different women um, are cited and mentioned in there and uh, how they decided uh, when they were going to have sex and, and how that worked out for them. You, you give pre-dating tips and, and, and you just sort of talked about just the, clearly the whole, the dating process in general, but under pre-dating tips, you know, there are some people who are so anxious to get married for whatever the reason. I'm going to guess that you don't recommend saying to the person, which I know of people who do, hello, my name is Sally. I'm interested in getting married. What about you? <laughs> is that a reasonable first question? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what else should I say about that? Um, well, you do want to find out within not you don't want to date for a long time somebody who's not interested in marriage if if you uh, are wanting to get married and so i would say maybe around the third or date third date fourth day you don't really know okay. each other that well yet uh, okay. but you want to have a sense of whether this is somebody that makes sense for you to keep seeing um so you ask this is in the book also in a gentle tone and you're not really talking about yourself and but you're just saying, so what, what kind of life do you want? You know, what, what, what are you thinking you're, it's going to be like? And, and if he doesn't, if he doesn't, if he doesn't mention marriage or children, then you say something like, well, in a tone that I'm not talking about me and you don't even say that, but you just this tone. So, you know, it's, are you looking to marry, have children, or you want to stay single? You know, what, what kind of life do you want? You know, asking someone what kind of life they want, what they see for their future, I think is a great way to get all kinds of information that perhaps a lot of people don't really ask. People tend to make assumptions, I think, not only in dating, but in relationships in general. And in marriage. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mind reading is, is a, uh, you know, it gets in our way when we think the person's supposed to read our mind or we think we know what Absolutely. they're thinking and a lot of it is wishful thinking. Um, Absolutely. It, yeah. So so it, it, it is good. And you do find out other things uh, like if they want to live in the country or the city or another another country. Um, and then, so you're going to get a, a sense of whether your lifestyles uh, that you desire are similar enough also. Tell us a little bit about the marriage meetings that you engaged with with your husband. That was the subject of your first book. What is that all about? You mean you meet once a year and you sort of review your marriage? What do you do? Heard, yeah, I've heard I've heard of people do it once a year. I recommend once a week. Um, it's just a wonderful way to keep feeling appreciated and also to keep appreciating your partner because mm. the marriage meeting has four parts. And the first part is appreciation where each person takes a turn saying what they have valued about the other uh, during the last week. And it, it's, so I say at least five, but you could go way beyond that. And uh, so, so that sets a nice tone and then you coordinate whatever kind of chores need doing uh, and who's going to do what. So you building teamwork. And then the third part of the meeting is planning for fun. So you plan everybody's her weekly date, but this helps you make sure that it happens and, and you plan it. What, what's it going to be and where will it be? And the fourth part of the meeting is dealing with issues using the positive communication skills that are also uh, explained step by step in the book that I wrote before, which is called Marriage Meetings for Lasting Love, 30 Days a Week. I mean, right, 30 minutes a week to the relationship you've always wanted. And the wonderful thing that about marriage meetings is that it prevents grudge holding and grudge yeah. building because everything, yeah. Yeah. your slate gets clear. Maybe you don't solve every issue every time, but you have a place to talk about it and it's done in a respectful way in a context where you both appreciate each other. You know, it, it really has been such a delight talking to you, and we are just about completely out of time. But once again, for our listeners, Marriage Minded, an A to Z dating guide for lasting love. I'm going to guess that it's available in all the usual locations. Right, all the usual places. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. I, I, again, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on this edition of Mind Talk, and I'll be looking forward to talking to you 
when you do your next book. So <laughs> now you, you, you've got a homework assignment. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me on your show, pal. Absolutely. Take care. Folks, you know, the stories we tell ourselves can be empowering or they can be limiting. I'm going to ask you to choose very carefully about the story that you choose to tell yourself about you. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I look forward to seeing you soon.